Uh, I'm Rogenio Sanz, I'm the Dean of the College of Public Policy here at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first, I hope of many, first uh, Latino uh, policy symposium. Uh, it, is, it is an honor to be convening uh, this event with my uh, colleagues uh, Juan Flores and uh, Roger Enriquez. I, I uh, first came to uh, UTSA about six years ago and very quickly I found, uh, and Juan found me, we found each other and have been talking about trying to do something like this for, for, uh, for some time and trying to bring together academics and also uh, advocates and people that are working in a variety of nonprofit uh, organizations to deal with the issues that are facing uh, Latino, Latinos. Uh, and also uh, we brought in uh, Roger Enriquez and he's really provided a lot of energy also and thoughts uh, on, uh, on making this, uh, this possible. Uh, so Latinos are the future of Texas. As demographers have told us uh, over and over again, uh, as uh, uh, Latinos go, so does Texas. As we know, and I'll be giving my presentation uh, in a few minutes, showing the, the uh, massive force of uh, Latino demography on, on this state and on this country. Yet at the same time, we know that there have been many, many challenges uh, that we as a Latino community have faced uh, ever since we've been here in, uh, in the state of Texas. Uh, issues related to poverty, issues related to work, issues related to housing, uh, and, uh, and these are the issues that we will be touching on uh, today. What I see in terms of uh, UTSA and the College of Public Policy at the Center for Policy Studies, that Roger Enriquez is the uh, director of the Center for Policy Studies, we see this as UTSA representing a major Hispanic-serving institution, and we have the, the obligation uh, and also the, uh, the resources to be able to push this agenda forward in terms of bringing us together uh, as we are convening us this, uh, this afternoon for the next day and a half to talk about, to discuss, to debate, uh, and as, to quote my good friend uh, uh, Juan Tirachingasos as well, he always <laughs> likes to say that. To come up with, with an agenda, a strategy map uh, of where we are now and wh where we want to go. Uh, so that so that uh, uh, so that it's uh, uh, I think very honored to be bringing together the researchers, uh, the advocates, and people that are working uh, with uh, with the Latino population and trying to better the conditions of Latinos and and their families. If we don't do anything, we know that all the ingredients are already there. Okay, we know what the path is. We've been very familiar with that particular road. We're, we're going to create a new generation of inequality, a new generation of being at the bottom of this state at the time when it is ripe for Latinos to provide the leadership uh, and the direction for, for the state. Uh, so that uh, that is what we want. We want the uh, UTSA, the College of Public Policy, and the uh, uh, Policy Studies Center to create collaborations and partnerships across universities, across uh, uh, nonprofit organizations, across other institutions that you all belong to. And we're very fortunate that people are coming from a wide variety of uh, fields, for example, and interest areas that they have, because it is only in the development of this, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, interaction that we can develop this plan. And this is something that Juan and I, for the last six years, we've had this dream of being, of being able that there is not a place, for example, a college or a school of public policy throughout the United States that has a focus on building policy for bettering conditions of, of Latinos, and that there is not a, a university uh, uh, institution that is able to bring these diverse voices and get them engaged in the creation of uh, public policy to better the conditions of, uh, of Latinos. So with that, I, I welcome you again. Uh, I hope very much that you have a very productive stay here uh, the next uh, day and a half. And, uh, and uh, now I'll turn it to, uh, over to Roger. Thank you very much, Steve.
everyone and bienvenidos to UTSA, your university. This is a state university funded by the state of Texas, a Hispanic Surrey institution, uh, the largest or one of the largest in the nation. So again, welcome. Uh, my name is, uh, as I said, Roger Enriquez. I'm an associate professor. Uh, in the, my appointment is in the Department of Criminal Justice. And I'm also the director of the Policy Studies Center, which I've been doing now for about three years. Uh, the, uh, I did want to just sort of start off with some uh, administrative uh, stuff uh, to begin with. You will note that there are a number of folks in sort of gray polo shirts with uh, the, the Policy Studies Center logo. If you run into any issues, questions about anything, those are the folks that you'll want to reach out to. And I want to take a little time to recognize them as they're still registering folks outside. But uh, Carlos can testify to, to it later that I, in fact, did uh, thank both uh, Marci Trevino, who I think many of you have already either met during the registration process and, or in cyberspace uh, and, and our communications back and forth. Marci is really the uh, heart of the center and is, uh, has worked tirelessly to, to be able to put this on. All of you know that many these events don't happen at, you know, easily and Marci has, uh, Marci Trevino has worked to do that. So, you know, if you run into her in the hall, say, hey, thanks Marci for all your work as well. I encourage you to do that. As well as Natalia Garcia, who I say Marci's the heart and Natalia's the because I'm not the brain, she's definitely the brain of the organization. And Natalia Garcia has been working with Juan very closely to actually put on the uh, substantive uh, materials and everything that you have here in front of you today. So those two folks have worked tirelessly, along with Carlos Rodriguez, who's there in the back, Isabel Romero, who's also a student uh, worker, a student assistant, who uh, will be here later this afternoon as well. And because we are uh, principally a, a, a higher, uh, an institution of higher education, uh, the four scribes that will be embedded within each of the panels is also a student here at UTSA. And uh, they will be working in a hands-on fashion with each of you uh, over the next couple days. Those are, you'll get to know Noelia, Villera, Selena, Rivera, Maria de la Luz, Marina de la Luz and Alma Zuniga in each of your respective panels. Um, so again, I thank you very much uh, if, for, if to them for all their hard work that, to actually put this to put this on. I'd also, uh, while well, she's Charlotte's not here right now, but the the folks from Nowcast have agreed to um, uh, record and uh, uh, make available later on the plenary sessions uh, for this uh, Latino Policy Symposium. So I also want to extend a thank you to them for making those resources available so that this can we can disseminate this widely after, uh, after our work here is complete. Uh, when Dean Sainz and Juan Flores first approached us with the idea of a symposium, we immediately thought, yes, this is absolutely something that we want to be committed to and to try to bring to fruition. Um, we already worked very hard to uh, you know, be a forum for public uh, policy discussions and, and community engagement, and then we try to disseminate that information through white papers or manuscripts, but this is something that is really very near and dear to us because as the dean pointed out, if not UTSA, who? Well, there's really not an institution better situated to do this other than UTSA. And while we can say that we're very committed to, to these things, uh, I think it's, it's important because we uh, were seeing from sort of a, uh, a front row vantage point the policy decisions that were being made uh, that were impacting uh, Latino families, right? So for example, like in 2009, when President Obama increased uh, the possibility for uh, uh, those eligible for CHIP to move from 250 to 300% of the poverty line, the state of Texas decided to, of course, keep it at 200%. And who does this really impact? Well, uh, when we look at the data collected by the University of Florida Child Health Policy, 62% of CHIP uh, kids on chip are 
Latinos. So uh, on the face of it, this policy may seem neutral, but the impact is far from neutral because 62% of, of those uh, enrolled in CHIP are in fact Latino. We see something very similar in K-12 education. The Texas Tribune tells us that over the last 10 years, a per pupil, uh, uh, the, the, the amount that the state provides on to per pupil is $339 less than it was 10 years ago. At exactly the point that Latino families need a strong, vibrant, healthy educational system because we constitute, according to TEA, 52% of the entire uh, enrollments. So at the moment that Latinos need these institutions, this is exactly the moment that these things are being removed and uh, you know, systematic in a, in, in a systematic way. We could go on with all kinds of examples with respect to immigration, mass incarceration, community disinvestment, all sorts of things. And this is really the, the, the work. And we'll, we're not... Uh, Pollyannic here and thinking that we're going to solve everything in the next 12, 48 hours, but the reality is that those steps have to be taken. And we just, the, uh, you know, again, speaking on behalf of the Policy Study Center, we just feel honored and privileged to be able to, to uh, help in whatever way that we can uh, to, as the sort of the tagline says, uh, find a path to power and prosperity. So thank you very much. Welcome to our beautiful campus. And if there's absolutely anything that you need, again, even if it's not related to just questions about anything, please feel free to consider us sort of your, your concierge for the next uh, 48 hours. Thank you. Faces in this room. If you're not brown, don't worry, okay? We're gonna hurt you, and you're part of our family. And that's why you were invited. So we appreciate it very much. I really want to first just uh, say real quickly that in trying to garner some support, you know, for our some sponsors to help underwrite the symposium, you know, the colonial program, housing program at Texas A&M. BP and T, formerly I believe City Corps, uh, Alasa Development Fund, Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, and Wood Forest. We really appreciate you supporting the symposium. And it's not just about the funds that they were able to give us, but quite candidly, I think the risk that they take in some ways. Because this kind of symposium is a little scary for some people, but I mean, just be truthful, you know. We want to create revolution aquí, verdad? And, and, and you know, we want to take over and have a little bit more poder, more power. And you know, that that's, that's scary. That's scary. And we don't disregard the need for gathering data, to doing analysis, to you know, you know, putting those facts before folks so that we can get those policies to, that we need to happen. But at the same time, we know that without political power, things don't happen. So yes, I agree, verdad? With that said, I really want to say thank you for you being here. We don't take for granted the time that, and commitment, particularly to our presenters as well, you know, who are doing this basically on a volunteer basis, just out of their own commitment, like each of us, to our community. So I really extend that appreciation. You know, I really also want to recognize for a second that in the room, as Rogelio mentioned, you know, we have folks here that combined together, we have several hundred years of experience aquí en este cuarto. You know, employment and economic development, in housing, you know, in service delivery, in health and human services, in education, in organizing on the ground in communities, in civic engagement, and in civil rights, and the litigation that has come to it. So that's what's in the room right now. That's who you represent. And it's a challenge. I, I, I really understand that over the next day and a half, what we can accomplish. The Symposium's foundation is the Latino family, La Familia. That's the foundation of the Symposium. Strong families reduce child development risk, 
and expand opportunities into adulthood. Specifically, how strong are Texas Latino families when measured by their resource assets that include education levels, employment and income, home ownership, and good health? We probably all agree that a loving family is a strong family, regardless of income. But it doesn't pay the bills or build economic mobility, thereby limiting the, and expanding the opportunities for children's futures as demonstrated by thousands of studies. You know firsthand the results and the outcomes from that. Another generation of low-income families whom are impacted with greater incidence of less education, more incarceration, teen pregnancy, unstable home environments, poor health, and minimal civil engagement. Wouldn't it be nice to reach a point where all Latino children make it successfully into adulthood with a good education, a living wage or better, a nice home that builds assets and good health? While it's really great to hear about those Latino youth or those Latinos who have become adults make it in spite of all the odds, you know, what is it going to take for all Latinos to make it successful? Not just those one in three, one in two, one in five. And we keep doing that from generation to generation. Something is wrong. It's our contention in this symposium that Texas public policy making at the state and local level is a major contributor to the marginalization and generational continuance of low-income Latino families. Specifically, the history of Texas minimal human capital investment approaches to policy making has led to unequal opportunities for many of our Texas citizens, particularly low-income and people of color. Latinos, for Latinos, the result is that today, there are over half of Latino families are low income with political and policy, economic mobility barriers in front of them. And one of two, or 2.3 million of Latino children in those families are at risk of being another generation of low income families. Extensive national and state reports have documented the negative impact from this state's policy making approach inadequate and inequitable investments in education, child services, job training, health care, to name a few. Texas policy making is entrenched, entrenched in detrimental ideological values, political power, and state rights perspectives that are often masked, and I underscore this, often masked by messaging of individual responsibility, lower taxes, right? limited government, all right? You're responsible for your success or failure. And most, well, frankly, that message is fairly effective. People buy it, we buy it. Let's own up to it sometimes, but not, we don't want more tax, we want smaller government, all right? But they hide the structural problems that exist in our state. And you know they're there, such as inadequate and inequitable tax code, okay? That is regressive and perpetually, perpetually for decades leads to limited budget to meet basic state needs, real safety net, let alone what we would call creative human capital investment policies, okay? combined with voter suppression, gerrymandering, and anti-immigrant policies, and you further keep families marginalized by reinforcing policy barriers to economic mobility opportunities. However, our state is assured by this way of making policy to continue to have a supply of cheap Latino labor. Punto. Okay. This has continued for decades, and as Rogelio has quickly mentioned, this, despite demographers, 
economists, the private business sector, demonstrating how counterproductive this type of policy making is to the state's economic prosperity, of which you know, we can make the best of it, but we can make it even better. You have, is any wonder that that's why Texas is in the top 10 as the most that income inequality state in the country. This working symposium is asking us to take a step back from our daily focus efforts. And, and I, I, when I say that, I, trust me, I appreciate the reality that issue us is in. Maintaining our funding, you know, doing our advocacy with limited resources. No tenemos feria, you know. And and and, and yet here we're asking you, so let's get sort of suspend that for the next day and a half. Think in sueños del futuro, verdad? What is it that we really want, and that's going to take us time to do over the next five, ten years? And whether we like it or not. If you want to, for a second, look at uh, what's going on right now nationally and what we know has existed in our state even before the current administration, we've had to deal in Texas. But, uh, you know, just the reality, you know, that if you take the far, what we call the far right, ultra conservative, and the power that they have now, and the power that they're using to undermine and marginalize our families, Okay, they started 40 years ago. Okay, and they they built this powerhouse. So if you think it doesn't take time, it does. And I know it's difficult. But how do we get ahead of the ball game? How do we stop reacting? I don't propose to understand the best way to do it. I just not know that even in this room, we got creative people. So I know it's a challenge by asking you to kind of step back and think creatively in a little bit long term from a variety of perspectives. And I'd like our focus in terms of stepping back and asking you to do that is to nonetheless utilize your experience toward a common goal. And that's to develop equitable local and state public policies which contribute to economic mobility and wealth building opportunities for Latino families. If we can create that wealth, it seems to me that's going to increase what we want to accomplish, including gaining power. The agenda that's structured, or at least our efforts to the agenda we structured for this next day and a half, that includes the plenary presentations, the discussion papers, and facilitated panel discussions are directed to the symposium objectives. One, review the bienestar status of Latino families. Take a comprehensive look at it and then kind of piece it out and parcel it out and see what's there from where we think and what kind of progress we think we've made. Identify the political power, policy culture, and structures that permeate and influence human capital investment policies. Assess the strengths and weaknesses, and this is a tough one for us, of Latino influence on public policy making. We're not starting from scratch, I know that. You know. But we need to look critically at how we're using what resources we do have, both individually, as organizations, and together. Create a strategic Latino family policy group plan that reflects our values and policy priorities, our values and policy priorities, and include capacity building ideas and approaches to achieve them, targeting three crucial areas, local and statewide organizing efforts across issues, policy development that includes data gathering, policy analysis, policy brief reports, and metrics for measuring accomplishments and communication strategies or methods for messaging our own messages that reflect our own values and our own policy priorities to multiple audiences and allies. Those are the focus of our efforts 
and I know it's a lot again and and challenging one ourselves. And I'm looking forward that we're going to have constructive, critical discussions. We're not going to agree. I'd like to add that in this room, there are Mexican Americans, Chicanos, Hispanics, and Latinos. <laughs> Verdad? I mean, come on. You know, and we come at things from different perspectives because of our experience, our engagement. Verdad? A lot of diversity. We're not like those We'll take those jokes. But really, you know, the real issue is how do we fit those ideas and strategies into something long term that we can work with. And it's not just in terms of any product that we produce. It's a product that's a working draft, a thing in progress that we take to another level, that we take to our friends, that we take to other organizations. But I am wanting to come back to one point. I am, at least from my perspective and my argument, is to take it from a family vision perspective. Okay? That's where children grow up. And when those children, because let's, if we have resources to create more opportunities and decisions for our kids, whether that's daycare, the schools they go to, you know, the, the, the sports they're involved in, etc., etc. That means that requires resources. That they have access to care and so on. They have a good home. That facilitates their, their success. So if we can grab onto that, so regardless if you're in housing, economic development, healthy human services, if we can grasp onto that vision and that becomes a message, then I hope that we can do something really good. That said, we'd like to start with an overview of Latino Bienestar, what we kind of call a setting the table presentations to begin outlining the common challenges that we all have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, we will move forward with the first part of the uh, sort of setting the table, which is looking at structural uh, issues that underlie the, the policy uh, concerns that affect the strengthening of Latino families. So we'll begin with uh, Dr. Rogelio Sainz, who is Dean of the College of Public Policy, uh, who will address the Latino demography and socioeconomic standing. Uh, Dean, thank you. Thank you. So what we'll start off with now is looking at the realities, the demographic reality. And I talked about that demo demography that uh, is working towards uh, the empowerment of Latino, the potential empowerment of Latino, Latinos, and also the socioeconomic reality. So these are kind of uh, the, some of the opportunities and particularly pointing out some of the challenges uh, that, uh, that we have. Hopefully you can see a little bit. But, uh, I'm going to be talking about the paradox of Texas, which I'll describe in a little minute, in a minute. And that is the, also the reality of the Texas political world, the historical and contemporary efforts to, that we have found to minimize Latino political power and socioeconomic resources. And then the, really the paradox is the demographic overview of the Latino population, that we see a lot of favorable signs of Latino population growth but at the same time challenges towards uh, Latino political representation. And then another, the other side of the paradox, the socioeconomic standing of the Latino population, and in particular the lagging socioeconomic uh, standing of Latinos nationally on uh, uh, many dimensions and indicators and finish up with the policy uh, challenges. So the paradox of Texas as it concerns Latinos is that on the one hand, Texas is a national leader in the demography of its national uh, of its uh, Latino population. We're the second largest uh, Latino population in the in the country, behind uh, California, in terms of population growth. La one year, five years, ten years, we're the leader in terms of the most population growth in the Latino population here in the state of Texas. Yet on the other hand, Texas is below average and in, may, in many cases way below average uh, with respect to socioeconomic standing of its Latino uh, population on many, many measures. And I will make this uh, PowerPoint available so you don't have to be joining everything uh, real fast. That'll be available. 
Okay, the reality of the, tex of the tele Texas political world. This is the reality in which we live in. And we try to say, well, ya no importa tanto eso, but it is a part of, uh, of the reality, the historical background that created and established Latinos as a proletariat population that was situated at the bottom, the lo loss of land and the making of the pro proletariat uh, workforce. But David Montejano, historian, uh, has uh, talked about the second class citizenship of uh, Latinos here in the state of Texas, the violence, including lynching, that uh, oftentimes is not taught, and it is not taught in K through 12 system, the separate and unequal schools, the Mexican schools that we had, and the disenfranchisement and, and poll tax of the Latino population. So all those are early ingredients then to keep Latinos down. Uh, and, and then there was a particular period, the civil rights era, where we saw some temporary social, economic, and political gains that occurred during the 1960s and 1970s as soon as the, the, uh, the power structure realized ways that they could get around this and in this, uh, they did, and we see the undoing the civil rights gains beginning with the Reagan administration and that have continued today. And now as the Latino population has grown, uh, we have the contemporary Latino impending majority-minority era. That is a time when Latinos are the, the a major part of the state of Texas and its future, and we've seen the system, uh, systemic efforts to minimize Latino political power and their socioeconomic standing. So let's take a look at the demographic overview of the Latino population. And here, these are the optimistic signs that we see. The growth that has taken place in a very short period of time between 1980 and 2015, over 35 years, you can see the, in red the Latino population more than tripling at that particular time from about 3 million to about 10.7 million. At the same time in yellow, you can see very, very slow growth of the white population. So this is kind of the demographic trends that we see in, uh, in the state of Texas. With, with respect to, to the uh, representation, uh, the share of the uh, Latino population, that it, uh, the Texas population that is Latino, we can see the growth that has taken place in red from about one out of every five uh, Texans being Latino in 1980 to almost two out of every five, 39% in, uh, in 2015. At the same time, with the aging of the popu white population and the uh, youthfulness of the Latino population, you see whites losing ground, demographic ground, from being two-thirds of the population, 66%, down to 43%. It is only a matter of years that, uh, that Latinos will come to them, become the demographic majority in the state of Texas. And this has been due very much to the age sex structure, the youthfulness of the Latino population and the aging of the white population. On the left is what demographers use, the age sex pyramids, and you have a, 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 along the vertical axis up and down age groups represented from zero to four all the way to 85 and older, and at the bottom, the percentage of the overall population uh, in a particular group. So females, for example, in red, zero to four represent about 4.3% of the overall Latino population. You can see a white base it, uh, demonstrating the very youthful nature of the Latino population. On the other hand, on the right, you have the white population, which is an aging population. No longer do you have the bars at the four, uh, over four, you have bars that are just uh, above 2%. So the aging white population. And this has major implications for the future of the demography of Texas. And this is a reality that we see that really impacts public policy making in the state of Texas. Whites and, and Latinos are two very different populations. In the case of at age 40 and older, the yellow is a, is a, it signifies a, a white population that is a majority in those age groups. In red, that's where the Latino population is a majority. So at ages less than 40, you can see the, the, the power of the Latino population in red. If we see then, uh, oftentimes we want to see, uh, there's these demographic shifts that are taking place. The Democratic Party at the national level says Democrats, the, the demographics will take care of that. We don't need to worry about that. But in reality, we have forgotten uh, the, 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 the white growth in, uh, in Texas, which is what I call the forgotten part of the empowerment equation. 
And uh, the people say, well, look, it happened in California. California was a red state, and in a relatively short period of time, it has become blue. Why doesn't that happen in Texas? Uh, and part of the reason is, and what we're going to do here is looking at the uh, voting age population, uh, citizen population. And uh, we can see in, in the year 2000, there were about 60% of both populations of California and Texas. The citizen population of voting age were about 60% were, uh, were white in California and Texas. And, but the similarities in there, in there, in the period between 2000 and 2015, we can see that in, in uh, California, the voting age white population decreased by about 120,000. In Texas, it increased by approximately 1 million. Okay, so you can see, uh, and part of that, why we see Texas continuing being a red state versus California is these kind of uh, patterns that we find. We can also find with the child population, for example, in California, uh, during uh, the, this uh, period, 2000 to 2015, there were about 20, one fourth less children, white children, in the state of California. In Texas, there was a reduction because of the aging of the white population in Texas, but only a 7% reduction. In migration, state, interstate migration, this is another one. In California, whites are moving out of California. Over that particular 15 year period, uh, there was a net out migration. There were 745,000 more whites than left California than entered. In contrast, in the state of Texas, there were 418,000 more whites that moved into the state than moved out. So this is part of the challenge that we see in the, the question, why hasn't Texas become blue like California? And what we see is these 14 states, uh, including California, are states where you have more deaths, white deaths, than you have white, uh, white births. And California, this has been going on since about 1998, 1999. So this is a demographic reality. We've also depended very heavily on our numbers to continue to increase, but they have been slowing down, and not only slowing down, they've been slowing down significantly. We can see in the earlier points in time, in the 1990s, between 1990 and 2000, the Latino population was growing 5% each year, 5% during the, uh, the decade, 54% growth. Now, in 2010 to 2015, it's about close to 3%, 2.6%. It is a very slow growth. At the same time, you've seen a slight increase in the growth of the white population. And we've also seen the further complications having to do with political barriers that Republicans have erected to minimize Latino, and, and, uh, 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 Latino political power. Uh, direct measures of voter ID laws, the disingenuous uh, drawing of redistricting maps, uh, and indirect measures to slashing the public uh, education funding. Uh, in the 2011 legislature, $5.4 billion at the time that Latino children were becoming the majority in schools. And we've seen the mass incarceration, which has taken away the vote of many people of color. But there is an opportunity. There is still an opportunity here. In the state of Texas in 2015, uh, there were 3.5 million children, less than than uh, 18 years of age, which signifies that every year 197,000 are turning age 18. And most of these 95, 96% were born in the United States and they're eligible to vote. Every month 16,400 turn 18, every day 541. And since I've been talking, about 4.8 children have uh, turned age 18. So this is an opportunity, an opportunity to engage these youngsters, to uh, register them, and to vote. Now let's take a look at the socioeconomic standing of the Latino population, and the data analysis for those of you uh, uh, looking at the, checking what the credentials are of the study. This comes from the 2015 American Community Survey Public Use Microdata Sample, and it's taking Texas, for example, as a base, and ranking it relative to other states. And Juan and I did a study about two years ago, Juan, uh, and this is kind of an update on that, um, so that we look at r rankings having to do one with the most favorable, where Latinos are the most favorable, let's say education, 51 is the, the least favorable. And then we have measures here for children, the percent of children, three and four year olds, that are in preschool, uh, the percentage of 14 to 17 year olds 
that are still in high school or have already graduated from high school, that is, they are not dropouts. Uh, the percent of children 0 to 17 with health insurance coverage and the percentage of children seven, 0 to 17 uh, below pover uh, above poverty line to put all in a favorable measure uh, direction here. For the adult measures, uh, the percent of householders or homeowners, the percent of the population 25 and older that have a bachelor's degree or higher, the number of STEM majors uh, per 1,000 people in the labor force, and the percentage of workers that are working full time, the median household income, and then uh, health care coverage as well as being above, above poverty. These are the results here. These are for children here that have those four measures, and they're the column that has Latino, there's a ranking. And you can see that, te that Texas, with respect to Latino children, ranks 30th when it comes to, uh, to the percentage of kids three and four that are in preschool. It ranks 32nd in, uh, in the percentage of kids 14 to 17 that are still in school or high school graduates. It ranks 45th with respect to uh, children having health care insurance and it ranks 28th when it comes to, uh, uh, to, to being above poverty. Overall, with those four, the ranking is about, the average is about 34. That means that 33 states overall tend to be doing better with respect to the socioeconomic status of their children. And we can see for the other two groups, major groups, white, whites and blacks, they also have challenges as well. But you can see that the, the rankings aren't as high as the case of Latino children. Uh, and in the case of whites, even though we're talking about 48th in terms of, uh, compared to other whites, in terms of uh, insurance, 94% uh, have insurance compared to 87% for, for Latino children. We see similar results for the case of the, uh, of the adult population. For Latinos, uh, one where we do find favorable, if we compare Latinos here in the state of Texas to Latinos elsewhere, is in percent householders who are homeowners. 56% are homeowners. Only two other states do better. But look at the white population, 70% versus 50, uh, 58%. Uh, in bachelor's degree, we rank 37th. In STEM majors, uh, 32nd. In uh, full-time employment, Texas, full, everybody's working, right? 30, uh, fourth place, even, but we still are not out of poverty. Median household, so 20th, and health insurance uh, coverage, 43rd, and above poverty, 21. Here, the average ranking for Latinos is 23, compared to 18.6 for white and 19.9 for blacks. So that it suggests that even though we're doing much worse than, uh, than other Latinos throughout the, the country, we're also doing worse than the white population, significantly worse, and uh, in some cases also worse than the African American population. And some of the rankings that we see, because you see some of the differences between gender uh, for, uh, for Latinos, uh, females rank a little bit uh, worse than uh, Latino males, 25 to about 23, uh, and then uh, particularly uh, foreign-born females, adults, 29th is their, their ranking. So the policy challenges that after going through this presentation, we can see the Latino growth of Latinos continues to be faster than that of whites. Uh, but still, in contrast to California, the white growth is a formidable kind of growth that we've seen. Uh, and there has also been the slowing Latino population growth. So we can't uh, uh, rely only that demographics is going to take care of us. And then the Texas uh, Latino socioeconomic standing, middle of the pact, uh, or worse nationally. Here we, t we tend to fare worse nationally relative to other racial and ethnic uh, peers, as well as whites and blacks in the state of Texas. And the policy challenges here, if we look at children and those four indicators, there is not one indicator that is positive. All of them are negative, and in particular preschool enrollment, health uh, insurance coverage, and poverty. If we highlight the, uh, the case for Latino adults, the only positive one is nationally the way we compare to other Latinos with respect to home ownership, but it's negative if we compare to white 70 versus 56 percent. And we also fare very badly when it comes to health insurance coverage, college education, STEM, and, uh, and poverty. So you can see again the ingredients at the top in terms of where we are going with our children if things don't change, 
it's going to be the recreation of that generational poverty that we see, the generational unemployment, the generational uh, lack of health insurance, the generational lack of housing, and so forth. And to give you an idea how much we really are behind when it comes to STEM fields, for example, these are the number of STEM majors. These are individuals who are in the workforce. They majored in one of the STEM fields. And per 1,000 people in the labor force, you can see white males are at the top. For every 1,000 uh, whites in the labor force, there are 123 that have a, a diploma that is a STEM field. Black males follow with about 56, followed by white females, 48. And then we finally get to Latinos, Latino foreign born uh, males, 38. Latino native born males, 37. And we go down the line and we can see that uh, females, Latino fam uh, females, are particularly way at the bottom in the case of uh, uh, Latinas 19 and 17 being the STEM, the STEM rates. And with that, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and end it here.